Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are listening to the Revolution Health Radio Show. I'm your host, Steve Wright, co-author at scdlifestyle.com. This episode of RHR is brought to you by 144.me. 144.me is a 14-day healthy lifestyle reset program. So if you're struggling with any area of kind of the four made quadrants that Chris is typically talking about on the RHR podcast, we're talking about diet, sleep, movement, and stress. Um, all these areas are areas that I typically struggle with. I know Chris has struggled with in the past, and so they, they really make up the foundation of our health. And 144.me is Chris's solution to how do you implement them all at the same time in our modern world, which can be challenging to say the least. So if you haven't yet, check it out. It's a great sort of reset program if, for instance, be your uh, goals for the new year are already sort of sliding to the wayside and you want to get started again, check out a program like this. Chris, you are an integrative medical practitioner. You're the healthy skeptic and a New York Times bestselling author. Thanks for being with us. Good to be here. It would be weird if I wasn't, wouldn't it? It would be weird. I just I was just running with that one. <laughs> Got a lot of energy today, and I swear I'm only I'm only running on Perrier. Perrier. Not even. Uh, All right. No, nobody slipped anything in there. No, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we get into uh, today's question, we've been forgetting to ask you what you've been eating. Ah. Uh, Right. So today um, I had uh, ground, leftover ground beef from last night, some salad, and some plantains, which I usually have for breakfast, as you know, Steve. I had them for lunch today. Um, you know, call me crazy. Watch out. That's, that sounds like a, a weird diet, my friend. It's totally weird. Yeah. Yeah, and then I had some uh, some water kefir uh, from Three Stone Hearth to, to wash it down. All right then, simple yeah. but effective. I like it. It works. So yeah, well we have another great question. Um, this one is from Yvette. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, I think it, it's it's not only just a, a good question uh, that we get asked a lot in, in, in terms of the content of the question, but it's it points to a larger issue that uh, I've been thinking a lot about as I prepare for uh, to offer clinician training. So it's I'm going to use this as an opportunity to kind of uh, have a larger discussion about functional medicine and how it can be used to uh, you know treat chronic conditions. So uh, maybe I'll stop talking and let you uh, take over. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yvette, and my question is, how do you um, go about, I guess at a high level, treating chronic fatigue syndrome when no one really understands um, sort of the root cause of it or what it is? Um, and the reason why I'm asking is that I've been sick for nearly a year without a diagnosis. I'm, I have a doctor who thinks I might have Lyme disease, even though I had um, some, some inconclusive results from my genics. And I'm stopping, um, I'm finishing a month of antibiotics, don't feel any better. And considering continuing with more of an herbal um, antibiotic route, but uh, I worry that if my um, issue is more um, autoimmune, um, that that type of approach might not be the best. Um, and I've you know, I, I don't have any answers from from, uh, from rheumatologist either. So I guess my question is, is, is what would you do in this situation when you don't really know um, yet whether an issue, the underlying issue is infection versus autoimmune in, in treating someone? All right, Chris, before you jump in to answer this question, I just want to let all the listeners know that if you'd like your answer uh, or if you'd like your question answered on this podcast, please go to chriscresser.com forward slash podcast question and go ahead and call in and record uh, record your question there. Thank you. Okay, so uh, fatigue, super, super common, obviously. I'd say, you know, it's probably the number one complaint. Um, we always ask people to list their top five complaints when they come into our clinic. And um, I would say fatigue is, is part of the clinical picture in probably 80% of cases, if not more. Um, the trouble is it's a very non-specific symptom, which means that um, you can't att easily attribute it to any one particular condition. Um, there are 
other symptoms, for example, like the thinning of the outer third of the, of the eyebrow that are more specific, that tends to be a sign of hypothyroidism. I mean, there are other things that pot could potentially cause that, but, but that's kind of a red flag for, for hypothyroidism. Whereas with fatigue, you know, you really, someone tells you you have fatigue, you really can't, can't say much about what might be causing it. Um, you, there's uh, a whole world of possibilities that need to be explored. And that's really, I think, the difficulty that Yvette is pointing to and the difficulty that we all face as those of you who work with people, you know, who are healthcare practitioners. Um, if that's all you have to go on, it can be a challenging place to start because you, you really have to ca cast a wide net. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference between conventional and functional medicine, how they would approach something like this, and how that relates to you know, this overall discussion about conventional versus functional medicine. Because this is fresh on my mind, like I said, I'm, um, I've been thinking a lot about these things in preparation for the clinician training program. And then I wanna talk uh, a little bit about my kind of model that I use in my clinic um, and how I approach a non-specific like, uh, symptom like fatigue. And, and then I'll talk even a little, little bit more specifically about um, Yvette's situation, like what we know of it at least, and, and what I might do there um, with the limited information that we have. So, um, you know, in conventional medicine, one of the biggest problems with it is that they mostly focus on symptoms and diseases. So um, if you go to a doctor and you have high cholesterol, you get a drug to lower your cholesterol. If you go to a doctor with high blood pressure, you typically get a drug to lower your blood pressure. And there's often little investigation into why your cholesterol or blood pressure are high in the first place. Um, the intent is to just bring them down. And that's generally the end of the story. In functional medicine, it's often flipped. Um, it would be an exaggeration to say that we don't care about symptoms um, because we do care about people's symptoms and suffering, but the symptoms are a lot less important in functional medicine, except in as much as they point to uh, Everything good? Down. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> I think a picture frame just fell off the wall. Anyways. I don't hear, um, I don't hear Sylvie crying, so I think we're yeah. good. So uh, the symptoms are important in as much as they can give us clues as to what the underlying mechanisms might be that are contributing to the problem, but they're, less imp they're, they're not as important because when you focus on the underlying mechanisms and causes and you address those, the symptoms tend to resolve on their own. So you don't have to worry about going after each and every symptom individually. You just address the root causes and the symptoms resolve. So that's the different... Uh, conventional medicine kind of works from the outside in and functional medicine tends to work from the inside out. Um, uh, and I actually have this, I've been working on this a series of concentric circles that's this uh, functional medicine systems model um, that I'm going to talk about during the clinician training program. And it, it starts with the recognition that all disease, um, the core of all disease starts with the interaction between our genes and the way that our genes express, and the way that our genes express is primarily controlled by what's been called the exposome. So let's break all those terms down quickly. Our genetic code is, is the basic template that we come into this world with. Um, another way to think of it is like the script that we, you know, that, that provides the uh, instructions for our, the, the production of our life, if you wanna use that metaphor. Um, and there are, you know, there are certain genetic mutations in genes that can either, you know, guarantee that something is going to happen to us, that's a lot more rare, or uh, make it more likely that we're going to have a problem in a certain area of physiology or function. So an example would be mutations in genes that are involved with methylation don't necessarily guarantee methylation problems, but they increase the risk of, that that you might be you might methylate poorly, especially um, if you are exposed to certain environmental factors. Epigenetics, on the other hand, is the study of uh, changes 
to genes that, that don't involve or, or uh, changes in gene expression that don't involve changes to the underlying genes themselves but can be passed on to one or more generations. And what we know now is that epigenetics is, is probably much more uh, of a determinant of our health than genes themselves because ge genetics account for less than for 10% for or less of, of disease and, and the remaining 90% is controlled by our uh, our gene expression and, and how our uh, our genes interact with environmental factors. So that brings us to the exposome and the exposome is a term coined by uh, Dr. Christopher Wilde in 2005 and it, it uh, encompasses the sum total of all of our non-genetic exposures that, that we experience from the moment of conception to the end of our life. So this could be um, our mother and father's health at the time of our conception, um, our mother's health during pregnancy, and then things like our, our diet, our lifestyle, physical activity, stress, social status and environment, external environment like um, the air that we breathe, the water we drink, chemicals that we're exposed to, whether we live in an urban or rural environment, uh, and then our internal environment, which would be like our microbiome and our hormones and, um, and uh, metabolic health, inflammation, oxidative damage, all of that sort of stuff. So again, if we imagine a circle, this whole interplay between our genes and epigenetics and the exposome is at the core. This is really what drives all health, what drives health and disease. The next ring out from that would be disease, would be underlying mechanisms or just mechanisms. And so these are different than diseases. These are underlying processes that lead to dysfunction. So they could be things like SIBO, uh, nutrient deficiency, hormone imbalance, chronic infections, etc. They're not diseases um, per se, but they're mechanisms that lead to disease. So the next ring out in the circle would be disease. And this is, these are things like Hashimoto's or type two diabetes. Um, they're essentially, they're constellations of signs and symptoms um, that we recognize as a particular disease entity. And then the final ring out would be symptoms. And this is kind of the ultimate manifestation of um, everything we've already talked about so far. And it's how we experience these mechanisms and diseases on a daily basis, you know, abdominal pain, fatigue, skin rashes, uh, whatever they may be. So uh, again, with, in conventional medicine, there's often kind of the outside of the circle is the focus and in functional medicine, the inside of the circle is the starting place and we move outward from there. So that's kind of the context for the rest of this conversation. All right. That's a pretty big context, Chris. Yeah, um, I hope I didn't lose too many people there. And I, it's, you know, um, I think it's really important to understand because it's, it's it, to me it describes um, the difference, the really key differences between the functional and conventional approach and the limitations of the conventional approach for dealing with chronic illness. Because if you, you know, if you break your arm, if I break my arm, I want to go to the hospital. Conventional medicine is awesome for that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, like emergency medicine and trauma medicine, there isn't, you know, so much of a need to think about genetics and epigenetics and, you know, diet and lifestyle and all those things. It's just a relatively acute situation that requires an acute intervention. And that's somewhere where conventional medicine really excels. But uh, as we're going to see when we go into the next section with a chronic illness, it's never that simple. And there's so much investigation that needs to be done to really get to the bottom of things. And the conventional system is just not set up in, in a way that makes that uh, even feasible. Okay. How do we how do we begin to look at something like fatigue, which could range from somebody who just knows that they used to feel a little bit more energy and now they're kind of low energy versus yeah. somebody who's maybe stuck in bed? That's a great question. So, I mean, <clears throat> the simplest answer is uh, it depends, you know, who's asking and who's coming in. If somebody comes in and they're like, oh, I'm tired and... Um, 
and and they're they're uh, living a, a they've been eating a standard American diet and they're really stressed out and they're not doing stress management and they're not exercising enough and they're um, you, you know uh, their sleep is trashed. Um, if I'm gonna tell them to do the fourteen four. <laughs> I mean, really, like that's why I created that program because, as I said, the core of this whole picture is diet and lifestyle and environment. And so, if someone's not attending to those things, that's absolutely always the starting place. Period. It doesn't make any sense to do anything else if you're not addressing those things. Um, I mean, you can do other things, but they're going to have limited effect if those, if those, if if sleep, diet, stress management, and physical activity aren't being adequately addressed. So that's the entire reason that I created fourteen four. Is I just wanted to have something where I could say, here, do this. You know, for someone who's um, experiencing all these kinds of non-specific symptoms, but they haven't addressed those basic things yet, because that's the starting place for everybody, including people who come to my clinic. Now because of the nature of my practice and that most people come to my clinic after reading my blog and listening to my podcast for a long time, most of my patients are already on that bandwagon. So, you know, we start at a higher level, but in the general population, something like 14.4 would always be the starting place if fatigue or any other symptom were that's kind of nonspecific like that were the main complaint. Um, but I know I can tell just by, and I assume by Yvette's question that she's she's paying attention to those things. We'll make that assumption so we can talk about how I would address it in the clinic. Um, when you have a nonspecific symptom like fatigue, you have to investigate all seven of the primary mechanisms that lead to disease. And this list is my current list. It's always changing and evolving. This, you know, it might change and evolve again by the time I teach the clinician training program. Um, but but it's a pretty I think it's a fairly complete and, and accurate list at the moment um, and the the seven would the seven primary mechanisms would be gut dysfunction this is actually a big category that includes a lot it would be include SIBO small intestine bacterial overgrowth uh, leaky gut low stomach acid um, you know or poor digestive enzyme production and malabsorption parasites, fungal overgrowth, other infections, and then food intolerances, which can be, you know, a huge category in its own right. Number two would be nutrient imbalance, either deficiency or excess. Now deficiency is a lot more common, and we just saw data from the NHANES Nurses Health Study suggesting that a huge percentage of Americans, uh, you know, almost 50 percentage 50% 50% of Americans are deficient in things like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin E, all the important fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, something like 97% of Americans don't get enough choline and potassium uh, and fiber. So these nutrient deficiencies are widespread and that's crucial because nutrients are what fuel, um, fuel our body, you know, basic metabolic processes. But there are some cases where nutrient excess is a problem and uh, iron overload, which is something we've talked about a lot, is one example of that. So tox toxicity, toxic overload is another uh, primary mechanism. So this can be caused by exposure to toxins like heavy metals or chemicals, phthalates, uh, BPA, etc., cetera, and, and mold or other biotoxins. Or it can be caused by impaired detoxification capacity. Um, so maybe the level of toxic exposure is minimal, but your ability to properly detoxify is impaired for any number of reasons, um, or you have a combination of both, which is the most likely uh, scenario. Number four would be hormone imbalance. This is another big category. So this could include HPA axis dysregulation, um, AKA adrenal fatigue, metabolic hormone disruption, so like leptin and insulin and hormones that regulate blood sugar, thyroid hormone imbalance, and then sex hormone imbalance, both in men and women. Um, number five would be chronic infections. So these could be things like Lyme disease and the various co-infections, mycoplasma, uh, yeah, intracellular infections like chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, and chronic viruses, viral activity. Six would be immune dysregulation. 
another big category because uh, this includes not only autoimmunity, you know, overactive immune system, but also underactive immune system, poor uh, weak immune function, inflammation, systemic inflammation, and something things uh, like chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is uh, biotoxin related illness. And it's something I'm going to be writing and talking about more in the future. Uh, we don't have time to get into it too much now, but it's I think it affects a lot of people. Um, that comes from the, the work of Dr. Richie Shoemaker, who, who we're going to have on the show at some point. And then the last one would be genetic polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. That um, these are mutations in genes that can lead to problems with methylation, cellular energy production, mitochondrial function, etc. And uh, you know, I think there's this is probably the most problematic of all of the mechanisms, and there there's still a lot that we're learning about. Um, but I think we know enough about some of the methylation and detox and cellular energy production mutations to use them to our advantage in the clinic. So I I, uh, I used to just list the six mechanisms that that became a seventh pretty recently. Um, so those so, are, yeah, those are all of the things that need to be investigated with a nonspecific symptom like fatigue. And you can see, you know, why functional medicine is, is as complex as it is, why it takes as long as it takes to learn it and why it can take as long to, um, address a situation like this as it can in a functional medicine model. So are those sort of like ranked one through seven uh, specifically, Chris? Uh, I'm sure people are, are going to be wondering who don't have fatigue. And I know you're going to get very specific yeah. recommendations for fatigue, but I, I can almost guarantee that your inbox is filling up right now yeah. with questions regarding well, this. It's a good thing you asked because that was the next thing we were going to talk about. So um, this is also an evolving process, but I'll tell you how I – um, structure things in my clinic and this will also be of course a focus of the clinician training um, you know with that's a tremendous amount of things to do uh, that I just mentioned and so we need to focus on what comes first and um, again you know we're assuming that diet and lifestyle stuff has already been addressed that that's kind of going without saying here but if it has been then the next thing uh, for me, I always start with the gut and the HPA axis and nutrient status because uh, those things are often at the root of or contribute to the four other mechanisms that I mentioned with you know, hormone imbalance, immune dysregulation, the effect of genetic polymorphisms, and uh, chronic infections. And the other reason is that even if you have any of those other four mechanisms, um, uh, toxic overload also. Even if you have any of those other mechanisms, then you um, you have to, like addressing uh, the HPA axis and nutrient deficiency um, and the gut will make, will lead to significant improvement in almost all cases. So, um, an example would be if somebody has, let's say someone has a chronic infection like Lyme. Uh, this may not be the best example because it's so complex and, and, and intense. But if someone has a chronic infection like Lyme, almost certainly their gut's going to be screwed up. Almost certainly their HPA axis is going to be screwed up. And almost certainly they have some nutrient deficiencies. Um, and if you address the gut, the HPA axis, and nutrient deficiencies, that person is almost certainly going to feel better. Now that won't be the end of the treatment in that case. Um, you still will have to obviously address the infection and, and, uh, and the hormone imbalance and other issues that might be present. But I think it's easier to do that when the person is at a certain base, you know, has a basic ability to function because their gut is, is working a little bit better. They're, they've got the nutrients that they need to fuel their body and their HPA axis has some support. So then after addressing gut, HPA axis and nutrient deficiency, you might move on to the toxins and detox infections, hormones and, and these, uh, you know, genetic polymorphisms that can interact with all of this to cause problems. And that's, that's basically how the general template and approach that we use in, in our practice. So for Yvette, 
Um, to get even more specific, Lime is a, is a real Pandora's box. We've talked about it on the show before, and um, it's a really difficult and thorny clinical issue. I recommend you go and, and back and listen to the podcast I did with Dr. Sanja Schwag, who is also my partner, co-director at, at California Center for Functional Medicine, our clinic. Um, he has a lot of expertise in treating Lyme and co-infections, and we, in that podcast, we really kind of t- took an honest look at, at the all of the challenges um, that are inherent to diagnosing and treating Lyme disease, and, and we kind of shared our feelings about um, about that. So if you haven't listened to that podcast or read the transcript, I definitely recommend you do that. And I also recommend you find a very, very experienced clinician and one that, what's the best way to say this? One that is, is um, open-minded and not 100% certain <laughs> about um, Lyme because I, I found that in the Lyme community there are some practitioners out there who are a little bit overconfident in terms of their uh, you know ability to accurately diagnose Lyme and and uh, I I think it's a little bit of humility and and honesty in terms of the equivocality of some of these tests and the ability to di- you know accurately diagnose Lyme in certain situations is a very important quality in a clinician. And that's one of the things I appreciate about Sanja so much is that he has a lot of expertise in Lyme and he comes to this with a lot of experience and he has treated a lot of Lyme patients, but he's not the person who's going to you know, treat everyone as if they have Lyme and, and he will tell you if, if he is uncertain and if the, if the data coming back is uncertain and, you know, kind of give you informed consent in terms of whether, you know, okay, well, we can try, we can go this direction and try a course of treatment and these are the pros and cons of that and we can not do that and these are the pros and cons of not doing it because really that's, uh, that's, that's how it has to be until the testing improves to the point where we can we have more accurate diagnosis. Uh, for you know for fatigue, I would still focus on the gut, HPA access, access and nutrients if you haven't already, Yvette. And then my next steps would be looking at methylation, screening for toxins like heavy metals, biotoxins and mold, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and of course looking at infections, which it seems like you're already doing. And then looking at uh, blood sugar and thyroid and seeing if there's, a, if there's anything that can be done there to help just provide overall support if there is an infection present. Or maybe if there's not an infection present, it, maybe it's more related to a thyroid issue or another hormone imbalance of a, of a different kind. So, uh, you know, as you can see, this is, again, a lot. There's no, unfortunately, no quick and easy uh, answer here. Um, but this is the this is the method that we use, and, and the way that I think it has to be done to in order to to really figure it out. Well, I'm sure that definitely helps her, Chris, and uh, hopefully she has some good practitioners that can maybe even you know you bet you could clip this segment out and and you know or take the transcript and, and bring it into the appointment. Um, so that's a, yeah. I doubt <laughs> anybody practicing. That's gonna go over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt anybody's practicing this this evolved uh, since you haven't even begun to teach it to too many people. Oh, you know, there's so many good practitioners out there who, um, well, maybe not so many, but there are there. Are, I know of a lot of practitioners who are doing fantastic work, and and there are a lot of people out there who just focus entirely on clinical practice, and they don't they don't do anything else, and so it's you know, uh, a lot of folks don't even know that they're out there. Um, but I agree. We also do need more uh, people who uh, who are embracing both a functional and an ancestral evolutionary approach. That's the difficult thing to find, really. I think there are quite a few functional uh, medicine, or at least a f- more growing number of functional medicine practitioners who can do the functional testing and all of this stuff. Uh, and there are a growing number of people with an ancestral, um, you know. Uh, evolutionary nutrition perspective, but there are fewer people who, fewer clinicians that have both of those uh, perspectives at the same time, and that, that's what the clinician training program is going to be all about, is kind of bringing those two things together and, and hopefully creating an army of practitioners that um, can practice a, a paleo, 
paleo template based function style of functional medicine because I think that's where the real um, power lies in terms of the, the ability to, to prevent and reverse disease yeah I can't wait man can't wait all right so I'll do it yeah so if you would like Chris to tackle your question remember to go to chriscresser.com forward slash podcast question and submit it there um, in between episodes, uh, if you're looking for updates, you're kind of curious what, what Chris is reading, how he's getting his research, um, he typically is posting uh, stuff that doesn't necessarily make the cut for the podcast or the blog on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, if you use both, obviously follow him on both, but if one is your platform, go to facebook.com forward slash Chris Cresser LAC and twitter.com forward slash Chris Cresser. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone.